Thank you for joining us. Um, so my name is Adam Basso. I am a manager at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, presenting today are yours truly, Joaquin Hernandez, uh, and Gabriel Vicky. Did, did I get that right? Even close? I don't know. Um, John Robson, unfortunately, is sick today. So, um, but hopefully he'll be here in the next couple of days. So our clicker's broken. That's how it works. Put the mouse there in the slides. So we have our uh, mission statement here, and I want you to just take 15 seconds to, to read this and, and actually think about what it means to you. Imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of human knowledge. That's what we're doing. Except for it isn't really what we're always doing. Um, on low power devices and on slow connections, it turns out that a lot of times uh, Web pages don't load very well, um, and we're actually conserving a lot of bandwidth. We're not conserving bandwidth, we're wasting a lot of bandwidth. Um, so in Q2, which was um, October through December, we were examining what we can do about uh, these particular cases where we have devices that aren't very powerful or where connections are slow. Um, and the reason why we did that was we saw some um, areas for improvement. The kind of crux of of the issue in our own server architecture is that we have monolithic page loading architecture. And that has served us really well. Um, and I anticipate that it can continue to serve a lot of installations really well. Uh, but when we have this monolithic page loading architecture, it means that uh, anytime we want to make a customization to the interface, we have to add an extra object to the cache. It's kind of hard on our edge caching architecture, um, and it makes it sort of hard to reason about the software itself. Um, in a more ideal sort of world, uh, what we would have is less edge caching um, with lots of object proliferation um, and instead be able to make micro customizations to the experience. So if somebody is on like a really small device, we can make a customization for that. If they're on a desktop device, we can make a customization for that. If they're on a smart TV, we can make a customization for that. Um, and what we thought would be the case, uh, would be the best way to actually do this, is to look at an API-driven approach, which is kind of the norm uh, on most websites, well, on a lot of websites these days. Um, the, the benefit of this is that we can really separate the data uh, in the business logic that we, that we need. Uh, so we actually took a look at it. The guys did some research on this. So you might be asking, like, do we actually have a performance issue right now? Um, I think the fact that we have a performance team at Wikimedia suggests that we care about this kind of stuff. Um, but you know, the, the real proof uh, is, is in uh, some of the data and some of the stuff that we're seeing in the industry. So um, we've been making steady improvements to the performance of our website and our servers, um, but some of the performance stuff actually has to do more with the network that users are coming on. Um, in the United States and generally richer countries, what you'll see is that we're going to be moving to a more LTE-centric world. Um, but in a lot of other places, uh, LTE uptake is going to be a little bit slower. So there, there's a bit of a curve um, for adoption of faster connection speeds and for that matter, like really powerful devices. Um, but we're, we're nowhere near actually um, having the fast connections that we need in order to uh, make stuff really go fast. So um, we believe that it is actually necessary to do more optimizations on the website uh, based on the fact that a lot of networks are slow and based on the fact that a lot of devices themselves are slow. And if we don't do it, other people probably will. So what you're looking at is the WebLite experience, which is a really awesome product that Google put together, um, which acts as an intercepting proxy, basically. So it takes our website and it applies a bunch of enhancements to make stuff really fast. It's really great for people on slow connections. Um, we're really thankful for the work that Google has done. We're really thankful for the work that uh, organizations like Opera have done, like to similar effect. Um, but what we want to do is actually add these optimizations to our site ourselves um, so that we can have a little bit uh, higher fidelity experience for users. Five minutes. Um, so 
as I said, we did the R&D on this stuff, and what we found out is that actually through using an API-driven experience, we can dramatically drive down uh, the amount of bytes transferred and um, the speed of first paint. That is like when users are basically able to start reading a page uh, and are able to start interacting with it. So it turns out it is possible, actually, to get a lot of these performance benefits, which is terrific. There are a few known uh, areas when we start looking at like what kind of things can we do for performance. One of them has to do with like how CSS is inlined in the pages. And on high-powered devices, this sort of thing is actually quite helpful, and we ought to explore that further. Um, we can also take images out of the loading and just load them as a user's scrolling, like as they're moving through the viewport. And that tends to, to have a big impact uh, in terms of performance and bytes transferred. Similarly, um, when we're looking at stuff like references, info boxes, nav boxes, it turns out that those things take up a lot of, of the loading time. Um, and we find when we start to remove those things um, and instead uh, grab them late, that is like when a user taps on something, uh, we can save a lot of bandwidth and uh, load time as well. So, you know, making these sorts of optimizations for different form factors um, and even making these optimization, optimizations generally can have a, have a big impact. Now, enough, enough of me giving the summary. I want to step into, um, or let Joaquin step into the work that he actually did. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joaquin. I work with the Reading Web team as a web engineer. So what we did this quarter uh, basically is to create a transformation API server that uses RESTBase and pulls out content apart so that we can then assemble it and get these, these performance benefits that we saw. Uh, we're going to discuss about two approaches. I'm going to discuss the first one, and then Gabriel is going to talk about service worker composition, which is a different one. So the prototype is there. It's readingwebresearch.wmflabs.org slash wiki slash uh, Wikipedia, for example, as an article. Um, the focus areas that we wanted to target with the API content server and the UI that we, we, that we did is to that the site should work really well on, on slow and unreliable networks. So our base case is always measuring on 2G. Um, if we can, we try to measure on, a, on an actual device because it makes a lot of difference. The phones are really... Uh, underpowered and it makes a lot of difference on how they render the, the articles. It should have an HTML only version for SEO purposes or if the assets, the JavaScript assets didn't load. And since it's a clean slate, it should give you a better UI development and prototyping. Uh, we all know how painful it is to reload Vagrant. So really quickly, this is the architecture. For example, this is the first visit. We're going to have an API server which does the transformations from RESTBase. Uh, and then we are going to have a UI server that is going to render the web application that will run in the browser, but in the server. That's how we get the HTML only version. So first visit, it just, it's just going to get a minimal HTML with the, the assets, and then the web application will initialize in the client and take over navigation and, and have client site caching and all that. So uh, repeated visits, like the second time you visit the page, uh, or maybe you refresh or you go back, you, what you're going to do is you, the browser is going to get the web app from the cache. So it's not going to go to the server immediately. You're going to get a Chrome. You're going to get the, an, a usable application. And then if it needs to, if it doesn't have the data on the cache, it's going to go to the server to get it. So it's more like a standalone client, kind of like the native apps, but for the web. Um, the scope that we did for the prototype, we didn't want to focus on creating features. So we just picked a really tight the core scope of of our experience, which is reading an article and seeing the images, navigating to other articles via links. Uh, we have a, a, a caching of the, of the application so that if you come back, you get an experience immediately, and also searching for articles so that you can uh, navigate a little bit in the prototype. I'm going to have here a list of the things, of the changes, the radical changes we did just for seeing how fast it could be. Uh, I'm going to gloss over the pros and the cons. We can discuss them later in the discussion session if it's interesting. For article content, for article loading, we're actually doing split loading. So we're loading the first section with the info box, and then automatically we, we request the rest of the content. Uh, that's why we, Adam mentioned the lower uh, first paint. It's because we have a different uh, definition for first paint, because we are, only, we are only serving the first part of the article, and we quickly then get the rest. But the first paint for us is only the first part of the article. Uh, so you get the viewport content really, really, really fast. 
we are, we are also lazy loading images. So images don't load in the HTML only version. We, we have the, a link to see the image. Uh, that's a decision we made. We could show uh, images to HTML only clients. We decided not to. We can do whatever we want. Uh, but this also means that the data transfer is a lot, a lot uh, we transfer a lot less data in all these underpowered networks. It really makes a difference when loading the page. Uh, we have a video at the end we can play later in the discussion if, it's, if it, it could illustrate maybe uh, the difference it makes. We are using service workers. It's a new technology that's coming up to cache assets, to cache uh, images, and to cache the application shell. Since it's a web application, that means that the application shell uh, it's run on the server and in the client, and we can cache it. So next time you visit the page, you get the Chrome really, really fast. Uh, it's getting, it has Chrome support, Firefox support. Uh, right now, for us, it's about 45% support. Uh, it will keep improving. Uh, Opera has it, and IE is going to implement it in Edge. And Web WebKit has, interest, has shown interest. We don't know when they'll do it, but they'll probably will. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. So about the content caching, we have implemented like the native apps. We have a database in the browser. We're using that to cache the content. So if you visit an article, we save it to the database. And then when you visit it again for perceived performance, we show it immediately. And then in the background, we try to get the, the fresh content. That also really makes a difference when going backwards and forwards on the, on the UI or when you visit an article that you already visited before again. Uh, it's just super, super fast. It really, it's a very good experience. Uh, so, the summary of this approach is basically this is a, a different architecture for the front end, so it's very difficult. It would be very difficult to use all the ecosystem tools that we have already. Uh, so for desktop, it would be a pretty big drawback. You wouldn't be able to use the, the gadgets and all that, and we will have to replicate a lot of functionality. For underpowered networks, uh, crappy networks and underpowered devices, I think it would be we focused on doing something like the mobile web experience. I think it would be something very interesting since there the tools are not usable yet. And maybe we could have a much better experience for these kind of devices. So kind of having a targeted experience for those uh, networks and clients. Uh, there's another pros like developer happiness, uh, having a pure UI uh, contained application lets you architect things without being coupled with the server. So you can have explicit state management. Uh, you can deliver the web app without having a server, so you could have prototypes. All right. And we're going to go on to the service worker composition. All right. So this was basically a single page application, what we were just talking about. And an alternative is to focus only on the page load process and uh, otherwise don't touch too much. So uh, the idea is on first load, it works just the way it does right now. Browser requests something from Varnish, Varnish responds with HTML. Uh, maybe a slightly cut down version of HTML that doesn't have nav boxes and so on by default. But uh, basically, this is how we uh, serve 90 something percent of requests right now. No change there. Um, now, service workers are basically proxies uh, that can be installed in a browser, which is, makes it very interesting because you can intercept specific network requests. So you can target it. You can use it as, an, as a progressive enhancement. Um, so after the first page load, um, most browsers that with support will have a service worker installed, which will then intercept specific requests. So we could, for example, target only slash wiki article name, regular article views, and leave everything else to work as it does right now. Um, so it intercepts the request, and then we can do a stream composition. Uh, which is completely byte level, so uh, it can be very efficient. Um, what we're composing there, oh, finally authenticated, no, uh, no JavaScript clients. Um, we will still need to, all these customizations that no, normally be done in the client will still need to be provided for um, authenticated clients without JavaScript, and that would basically be done by running the same code on the server side. We have basic support for that. We have a um, Server, service worker a wrapper that provides the same environment in Node.js that lets us run the same code. Um, but this is a shrinking percentage of requests, so we can afford to uh, do more extra work on the server side uh, because it's a relatively small percentage. Um, 
the composition here is uh, relatively coarse. It's based on um, page or web components, which are basically elements. Uh, you've probably heard about it. A lot of frameworks use this now. Um, they are, they are um, just elements, HTML elements. Um, the main advantage is performance. So here's different approaches of massaging HTML and on converting it. You see there are several uh, DOM-based ones, like this is a, DOM, a JavaScript DOM implementation and libxml. Sax is surprisingly slow when used from JavaScript. Um, and even libxml DOM is relatively slow, and there's a difference between uh, matching on ID and class, for example. This here is another library that just does stream processing, and it's a lot faster. It's about an over an order of magnitude faster than uh, libxml. So that is, only works on elements, and that's partly the motivation uh, for using these page components, because it's very efficient to, to implement that, both on the server and in a service worker on the client. Uh, to give you an idea of overall order of magnitude, varnish cache hits are, again, almost an order of magnitude faster. So a plain cache hit, uh, this is about seven times slower or so. Um, we will need APIs to support this. Those need to be cached because it's high volume. Uh, and we will also need a metadata spec for each of these elements so that we can aggregate uh, metadata for the entire thing. Um, to summarize, pros are mainly that we can introduce this as a progressive enhancement. We don't have to rewrite everything at once. Um, we our, don't change the way the page loads, so it's compatible with existing gadgets. Uh, all the normal events fire, and there's no complexity of a single page app around history management and state leaking and so on. Um, and it's very efficient. But the downside is that service worker support is very new and not very mature yet. So there's things like um, streaming, composed uh, views is only just being implemented and specced. And so uh, this is something where wide support will only be available in the next months, basically. Thanks. So in summary, we're trying to make stuff really, really fast um, and use contemporary software. Uh, to be able to do this stuff. Browsers are improving really quickly, which is terrific for us as developers. Um, the two basic approaches that we think might work are the SPA, the single page application, um, and the service worker composition model. And there's a bit of overlap between the two. However, uh, there are some uh, challenging pieces to this, and um, these are some notable ones. So like, what do we do when we have devices that can't run resource loader, aren't very good at JavaScript, don't have JavaScript, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the service worker approach might help out. Uh, the um, sort of React style approach also has certain fallbacks, but how do we handle that? And can we guarantee that like, when pages are read by spiders and bots, that they're actually gonna suck in the content properly? Like you might say, well, we, we can use rel canonical, but there's some actual work, like some actual analysis that needs to be done to find out if that's the case. I suspect we need to talk with um, different search engine providers and other people who are scraping content to make sure that this kind of thing wouldn't completely like, blow up the site. So um, something I failed to mention at the beginning was that there's a file called paradigm.pdf. I know it's kind of grandiose. Uh, paradigm.pdf on commons that has like the extended set of slides. They're a little bit out of date because we did some last minute shuffling, but you can find more detail in there. Um, and we will make an update to that file as well to reflect uh, some of the bullet points that have changed. But let's move on to the discussion portion of this. Um, be curious to hear people's thoughts about this. We understand there are kind of pros and cons uh, to this architectural style, and uh, that's why we're here. So I will click on this and take notes. OK. 
Okay, everybody in the Etherpad, let's crash it. So this is mostly just a start discussion rather than a, a, a targeted question. So it seems like one of the things um, that's an issue here is the long tail, right, of all the special pages we support and all the editor tools and all the gadgets. So um, I don't think you explicitly talked about this during the, the talk, but I'd like to, to hear your idea for sort of presenting this in a unified way. Like the, our current mobile app, one of its disadvantages is that it's not unified, right? You're in the mobile app and there's no way to get to certain special pages, right? So it would be nice to sort of hear about ideas for presenting a unified interface where we can do this fast stuff fast and somehow seamlessly fall back to the old crufty PHP code for this really long tail of obscure features that we support. Yeah, I think one um, idea that was uh, floated was to have a kind of null skin that just serves things like special pages without any Chrome, and that could be fairly easily embedded in anything that adds the Chrome around it. Uh, another, that, that would basically be an interim solution on the way to actually exposing these as API endpoints, which most of these actually already have. They have most of these are lists that can be also be retrieved through the API. So, so the idea is, I'm just sort of elaborating for, um, is that when you request some special page which isn't there, you ask core PHP to render it with the null skin, um, which just gives you this blob of HTML, and then the new next generation front end can plop that in the page somehow, and it will look more or less right, right? Um, yeah, because yes, you can, you can re-implement all this stuff in terms of API requests, but that's a lot of work. Like, I don't want to do that, right? I'd much rather just call core PHP and give, get it to give me something. Um, for the next 10 years until I get around to rewriting every single special page. So another thing to mention, this is the web, right? So you could have both things living in the same space and some URLs will go to one place and the other ones will go to the other one. So you don't even need to actually embed the content in different places as long as you keep the styles consistent. Yeah, yeah, as long as I don't have, I mean, I could potentially pay for an entire page reload and loading the main web page. I'd like to avoid that, but yeah, you, you don't want everything to like suddenly change places as soon as I go. Uh, yeah, I just want to add a few uh, uh, pro cons for uh, pro points uh, for service worker approach um, that I found interesting. So uh, Gabriel mentioned it very briefly, but uh, this does not break compatibility with gadgets because it's not like some of the previous proxy approaches we've seen, which basically reinvent the front end. Um, rather, a service worker works at a different thread in the browser. So when the browser, like as, as from the perspective of the JavaScript and gadgets and all of that, the page actually got. Uh, the browser actually got the whole page on the server, including the skin. The skin gets added in a separate thread as if it were done on the server. So the, from the page content perspective, it looks exactly the same as it is now almost. Like it's virtually in the, indistinguishable. So anything that works on like document ready, that event will fire on every single article view, even though you didn't necessarily have a whole round trip to the server. So all of that uh, works as I just wanted to add that. not really a question I have, it's just a comment about one of the sessions that we will have later tonight. I think it's very interesting to keep uh, in mind what uh, the presentation you've done for the last session we'll have today about how we want, we want or can use uh, MediaWiki as uh, another, uh, as a website we don't hold or we don't, uh, we don't have on our machines but we provide the code. Because I think if we get into the level of complexity we get with the kind of service workers you offer extra, I love the idea completely. But I think it will be much more difficult for us to uh, to provide the code and or the, the functionalities as new features for our other users of MediaWiki. If it makes sense. Slide with the related sessions. Well, I think um, doing more on the, of this on the client side actually reduces the burden on on the server side. So there is actually a chance of making it easier to host a high traffic um, MediaWiki installation. But I agree, if we implement this, and and that is an if. If we implement this with services, then we will have to provide ways to install that, and I think we're going to talk about that in the last session today and tomorrow as well. But I think there's, there are uh, solutions to that, and we are discussing how to best do that. Yes, um, 
So and just just as just as you guys wrapped uh, Media Wiki with Varnish or Squid, you know, ten years ago, I think there's some architectural thoughts about this is just an, another wrapper around Media Wiki. At least that that's my like high level hand wavy approach to keeping Media Wiki viable on its own, but adding things to it to, to make it work in, in high traffic environments. Uh, one request for everyone, when you speak, could you also uh, say your name so it also serves to kind of know who uh, people are? And uh, one question I have, so as part of the session, are you trying to figure out which of these two approaches are viable, or is it more trying to see if there is some other solution? So that's my first question. What is the goal of uh, this discussion? And by the way, that's Subu. That's Subu. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes, Subu. <laughs> I think we're open to different approaches. Um, we thought these were two viable approaches. Like, in all likelihood, we'd probably have to borrow some pieces of, of them. But yeah, we're hoping to like find out, OK, um, if we're to go down this sort of route, like what are some of the gotchas? Is there another way to tune this? so that it runs better. Um, yeah, and we can talk, talk about it here, but I think we'll need to talk throughout the summit as well. I'm, I'm Toby, and I'm the gatekeeper, which is actually kind of an awesome role if you'd like to talk. Um, I definitely recommend it. Um, one, of our, one of our goals in reading is to reach more, more readers in the global south and, and, and emerging countries, and we think we're going to need to do something on this level to make the, to make the um, performance viable. Okay, so the follow-up after that is, so in the introduction, you guys mentioned that uh, one of the motivations uh, is network issues with uh, mobile. And which of these two approaches uh, address uh, that particular aspect of the performance issue? And the second is, is this solution only for mobile reading? So what happens for desktop uh, reads? Which of these two approaches will kind of uh, carry over to that problem space? Yep. So. It doesn't happen very often that you have a desktop uh, client with a 2G connection, but it's really, really frequent on mobile. That's why it's, it's where the issue is more evident. Um, but so the approach that about the content, about the goals before, like one of the goals of seeing where we could go uh, for our UI architecture to make it possible for, for example, logged in users have the, as good an, as an experience as the anonymous users have. And the other one is about the content, as we saw in the first uh, part, like having the API-driven server uh, being able to make these transformations allows us to lazy load content as we need it to. And that benefits every, every client you put it to. It's just on desktop, it doesn't make as big as a, of a difference because of the connection speed and the browser. Yeah, I'd like to add to that that one of the advantages is that we can customize things on the client so we can react to network conditions, for example. We can leave out some content if the network con uh, connection is slow, and that basically allows you to speed things up. But doing the same if you just have one cache on the server is very hard. It would just fragment the cache because you have a lot of dimensions, screen size, device, network conditions to fragment on, basically. And if you keep those things separate, you can use the same API endpoints and cache them. Thank you. OK. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, how, who, how who are will, you? Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Matt Flashen. Uh, first, first question, how, how will uh, references and other user-generated content be handled for users without JavaScript? I think that's for the web app approach, right? So for the HTML only version, what we do is we replace the, the, the links with links to a different uh, HTML endpoint. So the references, when they don't load, you can link to any, I don't know, the page that has the references. And for the, for example, for the citation, uh, when you click on that, instead of going to a hash, it just goes to a different URL with a hash. So the experience that always works in HTML only. And then with JavaScript, you just can show tooltips, pop-ups, or whatever. Great. Uh, and my other question was, since we're talking about uh, like emerging countries and out-of-date out phones with really slow connections, are these out-of-date phones actually going to have the service worker technology we need for this? Um, hopefully. <laughs> so there's, there's different, different things to take into account. For example, Chrome, we know now Chrome is bundled separately, and it updates even if the phone is old. 
So old phones can have the latest Chrome, which would have Service Worker. Um, still, like the approach of the web app works without Service Worker. So you get HTTP caching, and you also get the, the in-page navigation and the content caching. That's why we did it on a database instead of on Service Worker, so that experience also works well with phones that don't, do not support Service Worker. But I think that's a trade-off. We can deliver a very stripped-down HTML version by default and then enhance. but. Then the disadvantage, obviously, is if you don't have JavaScript, you might not have all the features. So whether that is acceptable and whether that is actually maybe the, the best solution for somebody with a low-end device, I guess the question is how, how many no JavaScript users are there that actually have a full-blown desktop? Because those are the ones that would get a suboptimal experience. Hi, uh, I'm John Katz. I'm a product manager on the reading team at the WMF. And uh, one of the purposes of this meeting is uh, to really hear from the community. And so far, it's been a lot of uh, staff talking. And I'm just curious. I, I see there are some community members in line. Um, but for those of you who aren't in line, I'm curious. Uh, I'll ask maybe a couple options. And I want to hear like maybe if you could raise your hand and let me know kind of where you stand on this. Uh, there are a few options. One is, I don't really care. I, this is my area of expertise. Do what you want. Another is, I'm so angry with you. I can't even stand up to ask a question. And uh, the last is like, this sounds great. Uh, I'm excited. I don't have any questions. So for the first one, don't really care. Not my area. Raise your hand if that's you. OK. <laughs> we got one, uh, two-ish. And then uh, super against this. Don't even want to say anything. Or raise my hand. Yeah, there's one. All right, cool. We, I'm, I, I'm sure we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then uh, last, like, this sounds pretty good. We like what you guys are doing. All right, more folks. Awesome. Thanks. There's the other option, like, what is this and how are we going to do it? And that's probably most of the people. <laughs> My turn. Uh, I'm Tim Starling. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be completely fair here since a lot of the details of the API uh, single page application I, I've only just sort of seen now, um, so I don't know if I'm completely across it, but um, it seems to me that there's a big difference between the proposal for the, uh, the you know, single page API application and the, uh, the service workers. You know, service worker, it, it degrades nicely, you're delivering HTML, plain HTML for the benefit of clients uh, that understand HTML. Um, you know, it, it's an unequivocal uh, performance improvement. Um, you know, since, since there's a whole lot of uh, requests that just aren't done. Um, uh, it, uh, wh whereas, um, the, the, with the API-driven front end, um, yeah, you, like I said, it doesn't degrade nicely for, for, for clients that don't understand JavaScript. Um, it, um, it, it seems to be, uh, the, the case for it seems to be based on, on cherry-picked or faulty uh, performance data. Uh, you know, I've said that on the task. Uh, we saw in the slide that it takes 50 seconds to first paint for Obama, whereas I measured three seconds to first paint on a 2G profile with Chrome. Um, yeah, I, and... Um, uh, the um, yeah, so I, I'm just a lot more uh, positive about the service worker idea than the API-driven front-end idea, I guess. Um, I, I don't know if if you have any comments about that. I can probably speak to the the data. I didn't do the collection myself, um, but a lot of stuff does vary based on the sort of user agent you have, the the way that it performs rendering, the way that it unblocks the compositing thread, network speed, all that kind of stuff. So you will see like variances on that for sure. Um, high power devices um, with very modern rendering technology tend to do a better job. Uh, stuff that has kind of barely sufficient JavaScript support um, and has kind of, I mean, you know, it's kind of, kind of the same old drill. So it does really uh, vary. These calculations though were performed if you uh, have, a third party you have barely sufficient JavaScript support, and uh, if you're mm -hmm. on a really slow connection mm -hmm. um, in, in a country like Indonesia, where a lot of, uh, of uh, 
telcos in Indonesia distribute Opera Mini as their default yeah, browser, they right? Do. And Opera Mini's, um, uh, I was looking at Opera Mini's uh, recommendations for web developers, right? They have, they have a big page of recommendations about how you should make your website to, to be, uh, you know, to have good performance with, with Opera Mini. Um, and they said, please, please send HTML, right? They said there's this increasing trend in the web these days to send JavaScript first, to have the JavaScript, you know, download the HTML. They were saying, why do people do this? You know, please just send us the HTML and then we'll pack it down and we'll send it in a bundle to the browser, you know. So it seems like, like uh, you know, service worker, it, it, it's, uh, it's best practice. It, it's unequivocally, you know, better for performance. Whereas uh, API, it's, it's not best practice. It's... Uh, it's, um, you know, you, you say we want to do uh, the same thing that Google, you know, this uh, Google uh, Web Light page view is, is doing. We want to do the same thing as what Opera Mini is doing, but it seems like we're doing a poor job of it and we're actually breaking those services. So if, Lou, no, don't leave, maybe you have a comment. Uh, let me clarify the approach because we had to uh, trim the presentation. So the, the web app uh, um, prototype works HTML only completely. So it doesn't break the web or anything. It just runs the same web application on the server, on, on Node, right? So it, it has the same, the same rendering that happens on the client happens on the server. So you have a normal HTML-only version that works totally fine. What, we're, what we've done is split the contents. We serve less HTML, less CSS, and all these things, uh, and less images. So HTML-only, completely working. So the difference between the two approaches, I would say, is that the, the web app approach is like having a different experience, and you can link to the the old experience if you need to, but it's a separate experience. And the service worker one is like a layer on top of the experience we currently have. So that's the, the two main differences. I don't know if that helps clear it out. But the web app approach, uh, it usually seems like you just send to JavaScript and you get a blank page. It's not what we're doing. That was the, that's the first constraint that we, we were thinking about. HTML only version, working, uh, totally fine, both for when JavaScript fails, for uh, spiders, for Opera Mini, and all that. Okay, thanks. So yeah, probably I'm being unfair, uh, and I'll have to look at those t that in that in more detail. But um, yeah. Yep. Uh, Star So I wanted to ask about um, uh, caching. Uh, so basically, from what I understand right now, uh, our caching model is caching HTML of the whole rendered page. So how is that going to change with? this model and how the uh, validation or mainly invalidation would uh, work uh, if, if that uh, changes, if uh, underlying data changes and so on. Yeah, at the beginning I think we alluded to this fragmentation problem and right now we basically package a lot of different things in one response and have to invalidate whenever any of these change. And in this model when it's API driven, you basically request several pieces separately. And that means that some of those might be user specific. Some you might load the higher resolution version of something or the more bandwidth hungry version or the very cheap one. But uh, those are two separate requests and can be cached separately. They are separate APR requests. And those will still need to be invalidated, of course. But they also need to be invalidated less often because you don't have to invalidate whenever the entire page whenever any part of it changes. You can be very targeted so what what is the granularity of split like would the text of the article would be also split or for example would be the references would be separate from the article itself and so on yeah that depends on how we want to optimize things so we alluded to nav boxes for example taking up a lot of space and normally in the normal view they're actually collapsed so people don't even look at them and they use, I think, 40% or so of the HTML size. So those that seem to be good candidates to potentially make optional to load. What, what about things like info boxes? Could be, too. It depends. We, those are... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So yeah, that, let's, let's discuss it later. So that is basically... Okay. But the idea is to make this make it possible to have the infrastructure in place to uh, to load these things optionally, and which things we actually make optional, I think, is then up to discussion. So, just a, uh, a link here. We there are a few sessions related to the content part of the of the talk. Uh, here you have some links. We'll leave them so up there. Oh. 
Well. Yeah, it's actually at 1540, and the section tag one. Yeah, it, it changed a lot. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting sessions regarding that. Uh, so my name is James Hare. I'm not necessarily asking this in any particular capacity, but I see this being mostly sold as a technical improvement. But my question is, will there be any changes to the appearance? Like, will this result in the creation of a new um, layout for the website, or will it still look the same as it's always looked? Not necessarily. We, we obviously, you obviously can change things while you're re-architecting. Uh, but not necessarily should change. I don't know which part you would want. Do you want it to change or to stay the same? <laughs> so I have my opinions, but I recognize that people don't agree with me. I am perfect. <laughs> See, I would be perfectly happy if Wikipedia went to a purely responsive design, same mobile, desktop, API-driven, all of that. But some people still want to use Monobook, for example. And I don't agree with them at all. But they have their opinion, and I can live with that. The question is, OK, I guess the most frank way I can ask this is, uh, will you incite a rebellion by ch getting rid of MonoBook and Vector? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave that. Maybe. <laughs> no comment? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think it's probably worth a, worth a comment in, in, in that I see these as being two parallel interlocked processes, but not necessarily the same thing, right? Like, we would like to have more ability to change the look and feel of the site, for sure, and we think this will help, as well as making the site better, but we also understand that we didn't create, like at the foundation, we didn't create the content. Mm -hmm. Other people did, and we need to have the discussion about how it's presented with them as well. Yeah. So that's really, like, they're, they're, we feel like this is more of a technical, like, um, enabling type of initiative, whereas, like we're working to to become more familiar with with community um, perspectives on changing the look and feel of the site. So in the mean, so in the meantime, the look and feel won't change. This is strictly a technical initiative. I I would say like for the most part, um, get the te technical implementation working pretty well, and then um, start making the changes. Obviously, we're always in making small tweaks. And there, a lot of stuff is invisible to users. It's not so invisible to all of us. But yeah, I, I think it's a, a process. All right, makes sense. Thank you. Hey, I'm uh, Jordan from Google. Uh, I'm a developer advocate, uh, and I wanted to shed a little bit of light on some of the questions or some of the questions about Google Search and, and Chrome that came up in the presentation and provide some of my opinion as well. Um, as far as web light goes, uh, that's a stopgap measure. Um, it doesn't support HTTPS, and in my mind, it's not a long-term solution to anything. Um, Opera Mini and, and UC web browsers, they do the same thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's essentially a short-term solution to, to, to a, a network issue. Um, I share a lot of the same concerns as Tim had. I'm not entirely certain that either of these proposals really solve the fundamental goal in mind here, which is which is improved performance. Um, and, and I suppose that, that 50 seconds, is that first time to paint? Or is that um, com time to completion of rendering? Yeah, it sort of depends. I mean, so we've been running some stuff through web page test. Um, I could say like, so uh, when I'm using an iOS device, um, which doesn't have service worker support, I might see you know loading of the Barack Obama article take 15 seconds to get to first paint and then another 15 seconds uh, to load stuff down. Um, and some other user agents, you know, like notably Chrome, um, some stuff starts spooling a little bit faster. This but is yeah, in 2G, right? Uh, two, yeah. 2G or like uh, congested 3G or one bar 3G, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so it kind of depends. And some of these things, like we can't control the throughput totally, but you know, bootstrapping the experience, I think, is kind of the, the, the key thing. Uh, absolutely, yeah. um, and that, that leads me to another point: is is 2G is is not standard by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we found instances where 2G can have significant packet loss, right, and and reliably significant packet loss, and that in and of itself can make, you know, 2G worse than 2G. Yeah, yeah, we've seen the same thing. Um, one of the neat things that you'll see, like in the Android app, is it uses a, a two-step load approach. 
Um, so it fetches you know, the early part of the article. And that seems to be like the only thing that actually holds up um, very well on these really bad networks. And um, yeah, some networks are just, they're slow with all packet loss, but like you say, there's some networks where there's a high level of packet loss or users in, in mobile use scenarios, you know, they're moving from one covered zone to the next. Um, part of the thinking with uh, some of the client side technology is we can handle that gracefully um, as opposed to maybe strictly relying on HTTP status codes. You know? So the, the, the essentially you've got two proposed client side solutions here that you're thinking through. Is that right? Am I understanding that right? And it's a single page app and, and what you're calling a service worker solution. And is that what we call a progressive web app? At, at, yeah, same kind of thing. So, so how do they, I mean, they, they, they use technologies, these two uh, paradigms use technologies that are very similar. I think it would, it would help a little bit if you could put in some color on how they distinguish each other. Because they both could use web components, they both could, could use lazy loading, they both could use a lot of the same techniques that would improve performance. Um, they both could pull from REST base. And, and I think it would be beneficial to understand more broadly how these two contrast for purposes of decision making. Yeah, I think the biggest difference is really how the page itself works. One is a single page application, basically, where you have JavaScript state and you have to manage routing and updating the history. And uh, when you then go to a page, restore that state uh, so it looks the same way as the user saw it. Uh, while the other approach, the service worker approach, only works at the uh, request level. It's like a proxy. So that is the big distinguishing thing. It doesn't touch the way the page it itself works, the way the DOM works, the way JavaScript that runs as part of the load process uh, works. It only, it basically installs a low, small private uh, varnish server in the browser that does things a little bit more quickly. So are you, uh, can you, can you explain a little bit more about the role of REST base in both of these proposed solutions? Oh, REST base is just a, an API implementation. So it's, it's just, we just need a cached API. That is the main thing because this is going to be high volume and it needs to be low latency. So would they, would they be pulling in content from Parsoid via REST base or something like that? Yes. Okay. They so Parsoid. Possibly it provides um, very well marked up HTML and that enables a lot of the customizations here or makes them a lot easier to implement. So both solutions would use REST base to pull in content from Parsoid and populate the content of the page, is that right? Yeah, yeah. there's definitely a lot of overlap. How sorry would that? Sorry to interject, gentlemen. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we've got half an hour left and eight more people in the queue. So could we continue this discussion later? Thank you. So just uh, quickly go to the page, to the content sessions, and we will we'll talk about the transformation of the content, and that happens because of Parsoid and Raspberry. Uh, my points uh, actually follow very nicely from what uh, Jordan just said, uh, so I'll omit some of that. Um, uh, I just wanted to reiterate also that uh, Service Worker only affects the second view onwards. And a lot of the things that we haven't mentioned yet much here today is the prerequisites to do that, which, as we just said, apply actually to both proposed solutions. Um, and those prerequisites come at a high cost for maintenance and, and whatnot, but I want to emphasize some of the advantages that they bring, and or maybe you can do that as well. Um, because it also improves the performance that we have been calling the fallback. This, the fallback isn't that bad. And, and, and in fact, it'll apply to the vast majority of traffic. Uh, I imagine, right? Uh, we're not going to have a situation where most of our page views are going to come through Privis Worker, because most views tend to be first views, or the service worker falls out of cache. Like this is an, that's only an optimization. Well, really, what we're proposing is an API-driven development, uh, which I think applies to both solutions again, because like we just said, both will be fetching a skin from somewhere, some some metadata and the page content, and compose them. Except one does it in the main thread, and the other one does it in the network thread through service, for service worker. Um, I think from that perspective, the, uh, the, the, the single page application is pretty much a non-starter given compatibility with gadgets and uh, event handling and, and all of that. Um, but, but, but aside from that, I, I want to focus a little bit on, on the backend side of things. So one of the advantages that I see um, uh, using this approach is performance for logged in users, right? So it would mean that you're no longer penalized uh, for being a logged in user. Because right now, um, as already I mentioned several times. Um, basically, the experience you get if you, as you log in is you switch from 
being near the being uh, everything through the through the nearest cache pop to now being to the main data center, and you, you lose a lot of the advantages. And this would bring that back and give you a basically a primary experience. Um, the other thing I'm really excited about is the ability to do string um, manipulation. So things like edge side include, but in a way that actually works, um, and which would open up a lot of interesting doors for skin modifications if we want to do them that are currently simply impossible. So uh, aside from whether we want to change them, at least it gives us a lot of possibilities that we currently don't have. Thank you. So with that, can you give us uh, some overview of the, how um, the separation would have to work at, at the back end and what kind of advantages we get from that? Um, which separation are you, are you going for? I think the development model is basically if, if this is run on the server side, um, it is still pulling from API. So the, the same code would run there and make API requests. So you get the same uh, separation layer um, between the front end composition la uh, layer that, that just produces this view, can run either on the client or on the server, hmm. and the data that is pulled in through, from the API and can be cached again, even if it's purely server-side interaction. Okay, that's, uh, um, yeah, I, I saw it totally different, but this, this makes more sense now, yeah. Um, let's see, I have one last point. Um, just one second. Uh, no, I'll, I'll leave it at that, good, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Derek Jan, or the DJ. Um, so, just wanna quickly give my general opinion on this. Um, I, I sort of agree with what Tim said, what, what Timo said. Um, I, I feel that some of the benefits that um, Surface Worker would be, um, would give us are a lot more um, future-proof and a lot easier to, to add at some point in time. And whereas the, the single page application model sort of l requires us to do things that are not a good long-term investment, um, and next to that, build a structure that gives us also good fallback performance, fallbacks for the HTML-only version and all that stuff. So I, I think that that sort of, yeah, I, I feel better with Surface Worker. The only thing is that Surface Worker is newer and, and less vetted for now. So that, that, that sort of holds me back that we need to go full on on Surface Worker right now. But otherwise, everything in my gut is telling me that Surface Worker is a lot better approach to all of this. I mean, we're, we'll still be using single page um, application kind of stuff around that probably, but I, I have the feeling that it should not be the main uh, focal point of uh, the efforts. Um, but on that front, I'm also wondering, because I've been one of the, the people who said, like, we really need to look at Surface Worker uh, uh, like a year ago already, and um, I'm wondering if anyone has looked a lot further beyond the stuff that, for instance, Google has been doing with Surface Worker, um, so that we have a better understanding of what Surface Worker has delivered for other people, uh, instead of just Google and our own testing. So I was wondering if any of you have any experiences of have, or have been able to gather experiences about what other people have been doing that are reasonably large. <laughs> So uh, C. Scott pointed out that Medium uses Service Worker. Yeah, there's a lot of pages that are using it right now for caching just the uh, static assets, which is one way of using it uh, to get a quick, uh, quick improvement. The biggest, so a progressive web app-like uh, experience, the biggest one that there is right now is Flipkart, which is a, an e-commerce vendor in, in India. They went full on this approach, uh, exactly the same one. And kind of something similar is what WordPress.com does now. Uh, I guess they'll put Service Worker in because it makes sense right now. And there's not much more bigger sites. It's quite painful, actually, to get set up and debug right now. Uh, they are improving. Uh, I've been talking to Mozilla guys, and they really want people testing their Service Worker sites with Firefox Nightly. I've been doing it so. But there's not. There's a lot of sites that use it for really small performance benefits, like caching static assets, opening a cache for images, but not for full-on composition or, or web apps type of stuff. Just flip cart that I know of. But I think it's pretty clear from how Google and others have been pushing this that this is squarely aimed at things like Gmail and offline support and 
I think this is going to be, it's very early on in the phase, so this is definitely the big disadvantage. But there is, uh, Mozilla is rolling it out in the next stable release, and um, important things are already very, fairly stable. Still rough around the edges, but I think yeah. it's, I would expect it to be um, pretty stable half a year from now and fairly widely supported. Right now it's around 50%, and with Mozilla it will go up. Just one last comment on that, because I, I, we started out the discussion about how it's going to improve um, performance on mobile and stuff like that, and um, I, I think that's sort of the conflict here where we're working. Like we we said, we want to do this in order to uh, increase performance, but this is not there yet for a majority of those people. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It, if we're talking about the same thing, the same goal here uh, all the time. And I think that's sort of causing a lot of confusion as well. And yeah, there's uh, kind of like short term, medium term, and long term goals. Like uh, we expect an uptake of the more modern uh, UA technology. So we think by getting a little bit ahead of it, we can actually capitalize that on that within the next couple of years. Um, but there certainly is like the innovation piece, um, to use the I word. Uh, which uh, is something that we want to be doing continuously. And we think kind of adopting these approaches will help us to maybe do some of that better um, and faster. Now, uh, as Joaquin said, there's like some technical work involved when you're going to be a little bit of an early adopter. But yeah, really we're trying to serve uh, a few different user needs. It's just that we happen to focus on performance for this presentation and uh, frankly for part of our R&D. Can you hear? Yes. So this is so high. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's good. So I want to echo what he said about Pinaria, performance. Can you introduce uh, yourself, please? <laughs> I want to echo what he said about performance and mobile, because this is obviously not target to users who are not such, such a good devices. And I wanted to ask two questions. First, have our performance numbers that we've shown come from phones? Because testing this on Chrome hitting the phone icon is completely different, right? I mean, that doesn't extrapolate to a user on a phone at all. CPU, rendering, screen time, pixels, etc. right? So first thing, like if we are serious about mobile, we should really get some devices that people, our target users use and test there, right? First thing. And you can answer that if you want, or later. And my second thing is that for all of us developers in Wikipedia, it's worth thinking that we're not Google or Facebook when it comes to a single page application because our users don't have long held sessions like they do for, for the Gmail case. I mean, it's great. They should cache as much as they can. They should have offline, but that's not our use case. Our users, and we have the data to back this up, they come to the site once. So what Timo says, like first page load is very important. And don't cache the images from this page because I may never see this again, right? And we have some repeated usage daily, but it's really not the norm. The norm is like one hit Wikipedia, right? So for us, the source session is a lot more important, right? So we, all those articles in HTML5 about like how Facebook does, do, does the things don't really apply to us, right? So it's something to have in mind. So regarding the second point, uh, you're right. Like most of the visits for readers are, uh, are not recurrent visitors. Uh, the experience wor works optimally best for them to like splitting the content actually makes a huge difference about the about the testing on the phones uh, I've been performing the testing in my phone and in, you're right it makes a huge difference I have an Exus 5 and I've blocked my phone many times using 2G just trying to load a normal mo web uh, mobile website we have a video we'll play it later uh, it's pretty funny uh, of Chrome freezing and all that and but so yeah, testing in the device is very important. We're not there yet for these things. These are just prototypes. It really makes a difference. So when you see what the web page test things, these are not, it, like tested on a real device, it really makes a difference. You can see with Chrome emulating a mobile device and a real device, it really, it, it, does, it doesn't have anything to do with the other one. Yeah, regarding performance for very low end devices, the idea is to serve a really, really lightweight HTML uh, version that has maybe inline styles as well, so you don't get uh, the contention on loading the CSS and you don't block on the CSS. 
And browsers can normally render HTML as soon as it comes in, as long as they have the styles by that time. Right. And um, if that is the, the baseline performance, if you don't have JavaScript on a super low-end device, I think that should work relatively well. Because that's basically as simple as you can get. It's just HTML and CSS. Right, and I, I fully support that way of working. Because right? you can be sure that if you're running Opera Mini in a poor device, you'll be able to run. But we should test it, right? When we do that, OK, this is the number for an Android phone that runs 2.3. This is the performance number. And this is the one for like a BlackBerry, like the new one that is an Android phone. We should have those numbers because one number there really doesn't tell us anything. It's like Adam's Chrome on Mac, I mean. So we should, we should for the next presentation, and my request is that we wrap that up with mobile numbers. And I think those numbers will also be super important to have for these decisions about what content to include by default and what not. If you omit the nav boxes, how does it affect rendering time on low-end devices? We've got less than 15 minutes left. So uh, presenters, at the very least, could you try and be brief? OK. <laughs> I guess it's me. So I, I'd just like to foreground uh, what DJ and uh, James Hare, I think, uh, hinted on, which is the possible implications to the long-term architecture and user experience of the site. So one of the reasons that I like this general direction, despite all the issues I have, I want to make sure long, the long tail is supported, et cetera, et cetera, is that it gives us a, a direction and a motivation for slimming down and decoupling core and for enforcing a, a, a sharp model view uh, distinction in our core software. So the more that we can think about composition and page customization as separate processes, um, which, can, which happen in a single, in, hopefully in a single code base, not duplicated in JavaScript and, and PHP, but in one place. Um, this is good for the long-term health of our software. For example, right now, um, one of the reasons that you can't cache the page as a logged-in user and you have a poor experience as a logged-in user is all these weird preferences like um, article stub length, which you probably haven't even customized for most of these people, people in the room, right? But because you could have changed that, that changes the HTML for the page, and so we can't cache your response with everyone else's response. So the more we can sort of enforce discipline in putting that kind of thing as a post-rendering step that happens client-side or even one of the things I like about this is you can run that same JavaScript that would customize it on client side on the server side for people who are looking at it without JavaScript, but you still have one code base which is rendering it and it's, it's enforcing the separation between um, the content and the customizations. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is, um, you can think about the, the service workers can be thought of as sort of a, a separate app. Like we could, you could customize the service worker. We can have a hook in your service worker to install a different one based on your user preferences. And it's like downloading a new Wikipedia app. So, you know, we have the ability to, to give you a radically different, I know like for political reasons, we don't want to say that this is so that we can change monobook, right? The, the whole point should be, we should be able to render the monobook skin faithfully despite what the back end is. But if you don't like Monobook, we can try something completely different. And every time you follow a URL to the same you know, Wikipedia link that you've already followed, you get a completely different experience. And so I like this for the future of the platform in letting us innovate and try brand new stuff um, without breaking things for old people. Um, yeah, I think that's all I said. Yeah, cool. cool. Thanks. So, um, there is a lot that I really like about this proposal, but on the whole, I'm a no on this, and I want to explain why. The reason is fairly simple, and that's risk. The risk, as I see it, is um, manifold. So number one, I don't, we, we haven't um, put rest base um, to the test in terms of seeing how it handles the kind of load that um, being implicated in page views would, would impose on it. Um, that could turn out to be quite costly and require a lot of work. Um, it's risky because service workers are, to say that they're a new technology is almost an understatement. They're not yet a new technology. Um, and the next reason is I think there's things are not set up right now for there to be accountability. And what I mean by that is I, I don't see the requisite rigor with numbers and with expectations. What I see instead is quite a lot of looseness with both 
uh, the goals and um, how those goals are, like how, like what, essentially what the success criteria are. So Adam, you, you said, you know, well, we might not see big performance improvements in the short term, but we'd be capitalizing on a technology that we expect to be more widespread, so that's already an out. Like, yeah, okay, sure, we didn't see a big dip in the numbers, but give it time. Um, another one is, you know, I, it's not entirely clear what your setup is for collecting these measurements, and it's not entirely clear that it's reproducible. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's going to be very easy to come up with uh, like a, a success narrative uh, regardless of what, what you know, reality actually is. And lastly, um, I think the risk has to also be um, informed by an, a sense of alternatives. Um, so what else could you be working on that would serve potentially the same ends? And there's a huge one, which is um, changing the way we load images. Um, not just turning them off, but um, uh, lazy loading them. And I know that that's part of your strategy, but doing that separately without relying on new infrastructure would be a very safe bet in terms of performance wins. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, so on the Rust-based load, yeah, that's that's a, a real concern. I think we have to see how that actually performs. Um, service worker being new, for sure. Um, in terms of accountability, yeah, it is hard. Um, there are some testing labs that have devices. Uh, I don't think we have the time to set up our, our own entire lab, but we, what we can do is throttle connections uh, via access points, uh, and that, that's a way to actually test it on the devices that we do have to see how things behave. We haven't done tons and tons of that. I mean, this, this quarter is more of an R&D exploratory quarter, but I agree, like, we should uh, identify the thresholds and try to achieve them. especially yeah. for an R&D exploratory one. Yeah, yeah. and I, we're, we're partway there, but I agree, like, there needs to be more rigor around that. And we have to, we have to make actual um, judgment calls based on, like, what's the density of this type of browser versus that type of browser, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and in terms of alternatives, you're right. Like, I think that we should explore doing lazy loading as a first step, even without the new architecture. Like, I think that is important. Um, inlining CSS might be another option, even though, like, it makes us all a little bit sick. But, you know, it might be the right thing to do. Um, so I think we have to explore that stuff. Our plan really is in Q3 to look at some of that and uh, probably make some pragmatic short-term changes and then explore the bigger ones. I think it's important to clarify that it's a, a gradual path. It's not like a proposal to rewrite everything from scratch and rely completely on rest space or anything like that. I think it's uh, completely different. It's actually just we need a cacheable API that can be backed by whatever, PHP, can be rest space, can be something, as long as Varnish can understand uh, to cache it. And, and, and that's basically the only requirement we have. The other is the order of uh, implementation is also open because of, as you rightfully remarked a lot of this is independent of the overall picture but what we want to get is an idea of where we're headed longer term well but it's a bit of a circular argument right because you need a cacheable api because you're proposing to use so an hey, api hey, hey, for hey. page views we, sorry Ori. i think we should like we should continue this but we should let some other folks okay. speak. five minute warning warning okay um, my name is Maud Schubert, and um, I'm a volunteer working on the mass extension. Um, my uh, question is about uh, benchmarking this. Um, have you looked into some benchmarks uh, for that, that, that you can, for example, run automatically? So especially as a, as a vo volunteer developer, you always have a hard time to estimate if you do a change, how, how will this effect in uh, the loading time in production. Um, so it would be really nice um, when you are looking into that, that, that you could develop some, some benchmarks, uh, which probably then could be run automatically. So 
There's a couple of things you can do. You can use web page test on your local instance of development and try to see the difference it makes. And the performance team has a lot of, they are developing a lot of tools for accountability regarding performance. There's dashboards and, and if you can connect with them, they'll point you out to the graphs and you can keep, a look, keep an eye on them. Okay. Uh, first, follow up about measuring performance. I think it's important to remember uh, if you're trying to simulate a 2G connection in Africa, you need to both both lower the bandwidth to 2G and you need to simulate the latency because the latency is obviously much higher when you're an ocean away. So that needs to be simulated as well. Uh, and the other is like a question specifically about uh, the single page application version. Uh, are you are you saying that on uh, a cold cache, you're you're going to load the sh both the shell and the entire page rendered on the server. Yeah, cold cache is just uh, an HTML page, normal a normal HTML page. Okay, so in that case, if we're saying that most of our users are hitting uh, only like one page per session, is is this really like only a, a significant benefit for logged in users? It will be for recurrent power visitors, uh, recurrent visitors. So I think that's the best thing of it. Uh, cold cache, we always are going to be fast, but the other ones are the ones that suffer the most of uh, our slow experience. Yeah, and I'd just like to question this notion that people just come and they look at one page. Like, I'm not sure where that data comes from. I certainly haven't seen it. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel Kinsler. I work for Wikimedia Germany. Um, yeah, first of all, I would, I would like to say I like the direction, but we have to make sure we get it right. Um, and I think I kind of agree with Ori that there's probably easier ways to get better performance. I like the flexibility and modularity we would gain with these approaches. Um, thinking about the single page application versus the service workers, it seems to me like the uh, single page application is going to be a nightmare in terms of migration and comp backwards compatibility, especially with user scripts and, and gadgets. Um, I mean, one of the main reasons people still are stuck to Monobook is because it's hard to port gadgets and scripts, even to a vector, never mind a single page application. Um, it's not because they like the looks, it's actually it's because of the scripts and stuff and customization. Um, another thing, yeah, people have brought up um, architecture points, but I would like to point a bit more about uh, to, towards maintainability. Um, it's with a single page, we already have something like uh, a API-driven front end. It's the mobile app or the mobile apps, actually. Um, we would add another one plus the static HTML interface. Uh, I, I, I'm just getting the feeling that we are spreading ourselves a bit too thin there. Um, service workers seem a lot more conservative in terms of effort because in the beginning you have to just do nothing, right? And then you can just um, go basically, um, if I understand correctly, you can just incrementally pull out more and more things. I hope I got that right. And there's actually a lot of overlap in the API entry points that are needed by the apps versus web. No, I, I, yeah. Sorry, I want the person who yeah. was against the... Uh, yeah. Go, f go for it, dude. We've got, we got two questions. minutes. So. Um, so my name is Jaime. Um, I actually don't have anything against the idea. I have some things against the implementation. Something have been already covered by Ori or by Nuria. We need more testing, um, both on actual devices, numbers, and we need more uh, testing of server side. Uh, my own tests are not very promising. I would like to share them with you. Um, the other part is security. Uh, caching user-dependent data is an attack to security and privacy. So those are my main uh, concerns. So it's not a question, but... Uh, Thanks, we'll discuss later. We've got to wrap up, too. Yeah. So could you... I'll, I'll, I'll be super brief. Um, so I, I think just in general, I would agree with what Daniel and Ori had said. I think the progressive web app approach architecture makes the most sense, but I, I don't, I, I think the REST-based component should probably be seen as a last step, if at all. I think if you work iteratively, you'll find that by doing, you know, taking a lot of these table tags and turning them into web components for info boxes will make a much larger difference than actually using REST-based. 
And I think the 10%, 90% rule comes into effect here. If you can spend 10% of the effort to get 90% of the return, you're better off doing that than switching to a REST-based API implementation.